I've never reviewed Dragon Ball Z, and it's not by accident. On YouTube, I'm known as the guy that's reviewed One Piece, Naruto, Bleach, and many other popular series. I've even written multi-hour long in-depth reviews for the likes of Dragon Ball GT, Dragon Ball Super, all of the films, and because I valued my sanity, I also covered classic Dragon Ball. All of these excursions were massive projects that literally and figuratively took me to my creative and at times physical limits. Limits I was pushing past so that someday I could make this video. The final Dragon Ball review series that's been five years in the making, a series I've saved for the very end because it's where my career began. Get excited and strap in, folks, because this is going to be my longest and most in-depth analysis to date, where I will push even further beyond, deliver for all of you over the next month the finale to a series I'm convinced is so much better than millions give it credit for, and finally talk about my childhood favorite. I hope you're sitting down, because this is everything I've got. I'm Mark Fitzpatrick, and this is quite simply a story that needs no such introduction. I am of course talking about the global phenomenon, the instantly iconic, and the exceptionally exciting Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball Z. Chapter 1 The Saiyan Saga Mare wa wakusei Vegeta Okori Takaki Zen uchi uichi no kyousen shizoku Saiyajin da as first acts go, this introduction is second to none in Dragon Ball, no matter which arc you're talking about. Better than anything GT, Super, and even early Dragon Ball offered. This first step into this arc is packed to bursting with so much lore, swerves, rug pulls, reintroductions, introductions, stipulations, strategies, techniques, old and new, and sets up what's to come in such a perfect way that I will probably gush at numerous points in this video uncontrollably as to why it is so damn good and 100% that bitch. Case in point, Goku's spiky older brother, Raditz. So yeah, Goku's an alien, and Toriyama is a weird but very fun writer when it comes to this fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants type writing style. Unlike series such as One Piece or Attack on Titan, which have justifiably been celebrated in the past for their clear vision they progress through the story with, Dragon Ball is sort of the opposite in pretty much every respect. Toriyama's a massive fan of injecting comedy into his manga, and that's fitting because this dude pretty much improvised an entire story that turned into one of the cultural touchstones of my generation. No big deal. And while proceeding in that fashion is unorganized and has its downsides I will absolutely be getting into later, there are some upsides that really gave this series an energy that otherwise couldn't have existed without it. In the same way a crowd gets giddy when a comedian quickly claps back at a heckler in the crowd, we as readers of Dragon Ball can appreciate the chaotic blitzkrieg of creative choices that takes place in Dragon Ball, and no opening to an arc better exemplifies the upsides of this approach than the kickoff to Dragon Ball Z. Like, take this one for example. For pages and pages following Raditz's reveal, he bellows about the lack of work produced by this quote, Kakarot. We've never heard of this person's name before, so we assume it's a new character. We wonder to ourselves, who the hell is he talking about? And right as he's leaving his first encounter with Piccolo, we get this panel. And with that, one panel, Toriyama single-handedly turned the entire Dragon Ball world onto its head. I can see it now, the collective minds of millions across Japan being blown. And while it wasn't built up to, and while he likely never planned for Dragon Ball to take this particular course in the first place, he also tends to leave his story's fringes vague when he doesn't know what to write down. And honestly, that restraint, that ability to not feel like he has to have all the answers all the time, that might be one of the secret ingredients to this series. Unironically, it doesn't bloat any of the narrative, it's all for the purpose of keeping the project streamlined certainly, but it also doesn't cut off any options for him when he wants 
to take them. I mean, he introduces Goku in the very first arc of Dragon Ball and people immediately start to ask about his tail. But Goku and Toriyama, they answer honestly about it by not really giving that much information because they don't really know. And that works because it isn't important to the story. And while this does have its downsides, what this more lax approach offers the series is a unique flexibility to jump from a kung fu adjacent genre to a sudden sci-fi galactic epic in the snap of his fingers. Literally one chapter of transition and it's seamless. You accept it immediately because of course he's an alien. He transforms into a giant monkey. And yes, it's a monkey, not an ape. Apes don't have tails. Ooga booga strong monkey. And speaking of monkeys, can we talk about the introduction of Son Gohan for one second? But first, let me talk to you all about another galactic tale, one with awesome battles, amazing graphics, and extra cute anime girls if that's your thing. This is the global hit space fantasy RPG, Honkai Star Rail. From the creators of Genshin Impact, this free-to-play game sees you embark on a planet-hopping adventure aboard the Astral Express, where you'll encounter a stunningly rendered host of awesome characters to build your team with as you trailblaze across this meticulously constructed sci-fi world. Available on both mobile and PC, this game sports insane visuals on both platforms. Thanks to its top-tier cinematography and animation direction, whether it's cutscenes or the amazing special effects in combat, every moment is a genuine audio-visual feast, and with the release of this video you can now pick up two new limited five-star characters. First up is Blade, a powerful swordsman with the ability to obliterate enemies at the cost of his own HP. The more damage he takes, the higher damage he deals. Next is Kafka, a terrifying antagonist with a close connection to the main character. This ruthless katana wielding killer is one of the game's most anticipated characters. And with the release of the 1.2 update, you'll be able to experience so many fascinating turning points as the game reaches the climax of its current story arc. There's never been a better time to get started and if you're new you can use my link down below to download this game to get your hands on an extra 50 stellar jade just use my promo code on the screen right now or scan my qr code and you're good to go once again my link's in the description and it's entirely free <laughs> I think it's clear that Toriyama wanted him to be as different from his father as he could possibly muster. Which, importantly and interestingly, is a vital aspect of the story that informs not just his role in this arc, but for the most part informs a lot of the story that he will ultimately tell in this series. But as introductions to a character and as introductions to this general idea broadly speaking goes, I don't think it could have been handled any better. It isn't often we get to watch a main character grow up and then be overshadowed by their children, mostly due to that offspring always on some level being compared to their fathers and never living up to them. And while there is an element of this in Gohan, it's that very element that makes him as fascinating as he otherwise ends up becoming. Acting as a character study that simultaneously highlights Goku's strengths and eventually his weaknesses. And to achieve such a sophisticated character, Akira Toriyama wrote Gohan to be, in almost every area of his character's personality, the total opposite to Goku. And to see this, you need not look any further than their introductions. If we cast our minds back to the opening of Dragon Ball's first arc for Goku, he's entirely independent, confident, practices martial arts, is incredibly strong, a little rough around the edges when it comes to his manners, and even saves Bulma after their first meeting. Immediately, his role is clear to us. He's a capable hero. But if we look at Gohan's introduction, he's incredibly shy, hides behind his father, doesn't know how to fight, appears helpless, is polite beyond his years, and doesn't save someone, but instead gets kidnapped himself. This establishes Gohan immediately as an entirely different character and entity to that of his father. But there is something more there than just a helpless crying child. And that search for that hero inside of himself is central to Gohan's entire story in Dragon Ball Z. A journey that begins in a stranger's space pod on a grassy barren field somewhere on Earth as he awaits his heroic father's rescue. <laughs> Goku and Piccolo versus Raditz. That right there was probably my favorite quote from Goku during the Saiyan saga. On its face, it's a rather innocuous line that speaks to Goku's disagreeing with his brother's assessment of him and his abilities, but for me at least, this one line represents the prevailing theme of not just this arc, but 
perhaps this entire story. Raditz is a character that is present in the beginning of this story, but is quickly forgotten. However, for me, he represents what is my favorite story told in Dragon Ball. A story of expectations versus reality, nature versus nurture, and allyship versus selfish conquest. I spoke on this generally with Toriyama's introduction to Gohan moments ago, but the same is true for Raditz in this fight and indeed the other Saiyans that make their presence felt later on in the story. They are designed to represent an antithetical ideology and culture to that of Goku in order to highlight his differences. His weakness is sure, but also indeed his strengths. Even beyond that, if we look at the Scouter, an iconic piece of tech that Raditz introduces to the story, while these metrics are fun to speculate on and mess around with in private or with friends online, the entire point of the Scouter's introduction with this story is to provide yet another metric by which the Earthlings understand what true power is, and how Raditz and indeed the other forces of Frieza's army are misguided ironically. That true power comes from manipulation of key, group strategy, and specific martial arts proficiency rather than brute force and strength alone. You'll notice that those with the scouters, devices that are designed to give the wearer a better idea of what they're seeing, are in fact the most blind on the battlefield. In the case of Raditz, he's taken off guard not once, not twice, not even three times, but at numerous instances to varying degrees of severity, this scouter Raditz relied on put him on the back foot and caused him to underestimate Piccolo, and perhaps most crucially, his brother, Goku. <laughs> this fight is perfect. Sure, it's not as good as other major fights in the story, or even this arc, but it was never designed to be. This fraternal conflict instead is here to set the stage for what's to come next and to establish the theme of the arc as a whole. That theme being, the differences we are criticized for can be our greatest strengths. And you need look no further for validation of this sentiment than this battle here with Raditz. Criticized, chastised, and taken advantage of for acting contrary to the ruthless warrior Raditz claims all Saiyans should naturally be, Goku stands in opposition to him and this ideology by rejecting his offer, allying himself with his greatest enemy, surprising him with a technique he learned from a dear friend and mentor, and finally defeats him with the help of Piccolo in what is the most selfless act he's offered in this series so far. And honestly, quite brilliantly, Raditz could never have seen this move coming because Raditz could never foresee a world where he would do the same for anyone else. In more ways than one, Raditz's worldview limited his abilities all the while Goku, because of his sacrifices and virtues, has a community of friends supporting him that will march quite literally to hell and back in order to bring him back from the brink. Earlier on, I claimed that this first act does a lot, but in reality, it does everything. It changes the atmosphere of the entire story retroactively while not contradicting anything. It establishes a brand new main character for us to follow in Gohan, provides a captivating angle or theme from which to digest this story through, and sets up countless other facets to this story, all the while demonstrating one of the most breakneck, tightly paced fights in the series. And did I mention that the main character dies? An interesting and frankly morbid piece of trivia concerning this chapter's release is that one month following it, Emperor Hirohito died, and one month following that, the father of manga himself, Osamu Tezuka, passed away also. So in reality, over the course of a little over 2.5 months, the Japanese public had been shocked by a tragic passing following Goku's first ever death in the manga, and with three prolific figures of the time having passed, the start of 1989 was a turbulent one for Japan. So yeah, this fight is everything. Everything on a much smaller scale than what is admittedly right around the corner is prefaced in this fight and serves as the perfect launch pad. And I think a lot of that gets lost in translation because of how many people start Dragon Ball with the first arc of Z. It's easy to forget that this fight isn't just the story of Goku, but a vital chapter also in the story of Piccolo and his gradual shift in standing with the main cast. Once the most overwhelming villain to have ever graced the Dragon Ball world, now unlikely allies with his arch nemesis Goku against a formidable foe from the stars. Piccolo's change is slow, but it is seismic. 
And just as we think that we've got our feet under us following Raditz's impactful entry and exit stage left, Gohan is kidnapped by the greatest supervillain this world has ever seen for special training. For as it happens, thanks to the scouter Raditz was wearing, his allies, the Saiyans, are arriving in a single year all the while Goku, the Earth's hero, is hurled into what will soon become my favorite setting in all of Dragon Ball, Otherworld. But before we move on, just a quick heads up that I have a huge announcement later on in this video, so stay tuned. There are two things I love about second acts in stories, training arcs and tournament arcs, neither of which Dragon Ball is in particularly short supply of. And in this particular second act, there are two main plot lines to follow as well as the looming threat on the horizon driving all the action that's taking place. So let's start with my favorite one. All the world and the wacky adventures of Goku on the way to train with King Kai. You know a training arc is going to be good when in order to qualify for said training, you need to 1. Be dead. 2. Be one of the lucky few actually chosen to travel with their physical bodies in the first place. And 3. Traverse a seemingly endless 1 million kilometer road that has only once been crossed in the last 100 million years. This is a small aside, but unironically, Snake Way as well as Goku's journey on it has been one of the main inspirations as to why I started running marathons in the first place. It's a simple but immensely effective visual and physical challenge for us to understand as readers, not to mention a fun one. Visually, it's striking with the clouds beneath acting as an abyss, the likes of which threaten to swallow up Goku if he misses so much as a single step. And in addition to all of that, it's contrasted with this look that just screams, let's do it, as soon as he heads off flying. And for whatever reason, this scene has always stuck in my head as sort of this encapsulation of exactly what I love about Goku. And as a kid, it was always something I tried to take inspiration from. That there will be seemingly impossible challenges ahead, but all of those challenges, if you approach them with the right attitude, you really can handle them. Goku's a character I love, and this environment really dragged out some of my favorite qualities of his. And that's not even to mention the filler in the original broadcast either. And while I will remain consistent and say that I don't typically enjoy filler and that if you're looking for a pure experience as the original author intended, you should read the manga or go watch Kai or something. With all that said, these episodes are still some of my favorite fillers of all time. Pulling the trigger on Goku falling into hell only to find himself in a series of challenges against these two lunkheads was a great idea and the misdirection at Princess Snake's palace only further elevated the treacherous path Goku had to navigate on his way to King Kai's training. But the street cleaner gag is just too perfect. I cannot help but imagine that Akira Turama wished and was kicking himself for not having come up with it himself. It's just too perfect and it might be my favorite visual gag of all time. <laughs> Whenever I read this manga or watch through this story, I'm always struck by how wonderfully Gohan's journey contrasts his father's original path as a child. All the while Goku gleefully and resolutely marches down an impossible path, his son Gohan is struggling to do the very basics of survival, even with the help of an unlikely babysitter. Casting our minds back yet again, we can recall what Goku's first significant on-screen training was as a child. After demonstrating his abilities and proving himself worthy of Master Roshi's tutelage, Goku chose to willingly seek out the guidance of and training of who was, at the time, the Earth's greatest hero. Contrast that now with Gohan, someone who too was chosen based on the merits he demonstrated, but was kidnapped, forced to take the training of not the Earth's hero, but instead its ultimate villain. And I honestly enjoyed noticing these little choices because it clearly demonstrated that from the very beginning, Gohan was never meant to be like Goku, which is, I found, not only interesting as a character study, but additionally, as I found, offered the series something it otherwise hadn't in any meaningful capacity prior. Looking back on the early Dragon Ball series, there were of course plenty of opportunities for us to share time with Goku as he trained with various individuals and masters. We've seen him train with people like Krillin, but outside of his direct involvement, any secondary character's training took place off screen. Goku needed to be present in order for us to see their training for the most part. However, this time around, in the Saiyan Saga, no such mistreatment of secondary characters takes place this time. Mostly. In the past, this was the Goku show. But something is different this time around, and it's thanks to Gohan, who now assumes a comfortable and natural position in the B-plot. 
not just helping the pacing of this arc tremendously, not just offering up screen time to the likes of Piccolo, who has up until now only shared the screen with Goku, but it is the first indication we've gotten that signals the importance of the Gohan character moving forward, and how in more ways than one, Dragon Ball Z isn't simply the story of Goku, it's the rise of Gohan. <laughs> Something of note also is that while I referred to Gohan's training under Piccolo as the B-plot earlier, it's worth noting that for the time being, it could be quite easily considered the A-plot, with Gohan's training standing at 3 chapters worth of material compared to Goku's 1.5 chapters of total time spent on King Kai's planet. However, it's hard to shake the feeling that Goku's time spent on King Kai's planet was exceptionally special. Or at least it was for me. It's the first training arc I ever watched personally, I loved it, but what's interesting is that it's the first one for Goku on screen in quite some time too. While in the past Goku had training with Roshi and Kami and technically his grandpa Gohan prior to the series, this training we see and enjoy on this small but memorable planet is the first piece of training we're privy to as audience members for Goku since his training alongside Krillin with Master Roshi in the second arc of the story. That's ages ago. And as training goes, it's near perfect. Firstly, King Kai is hilarious. Much the same way Roshi was an eccentric wise old teacher, King Kai follows suit with 100% less horny. Those of you who know me will understand why I vastly prefer King Kai. Secondly, King Kai's planet is the first use of enhanced gravity in the series for the purpose of training, making it a natural evolution on the weighted clothing idea introduced in early Dragon Ball. And thirdly, as I mentioned, only 1.5 chapters worth of training is spent with Goku on King Kai's, which honestly made me reflect on why I felt so strongly about this material as a highlight of the series. And then, it hit me. Much of the actual on-screen training we get from King Kai is just comedic relief. Very good comedic relief at that, but still just comedic relief. The actual training we do get is classic Dragon Ball, however. Meaning, it is all about the fundamentals. Traditionally, that has been Toriyama's approach with training in this series, but its use here works exceptionally well when you take into consideration the broader context of the arc. In other words, when you take into account its themes. Right around the corner is a battle of good versus evil, of elite versus lower class, of natural talent versus hard work. Outside of catching bubbles, almost all of Goku's technique training with King Kai is kept surprisingly vague and secretive given that we as an audience are present to watch him train in more than one instant. We hear some non-specific talk of the Kaioken and then Goku firing what appears to be a key blast, but all of these moments are intentional. This withdrawing, this withholding of information is intentional. These moments are all planting seeds, allowing these crops to be harvested in spades once Goku reaches Earth. And similarly, the vast majority of the other individuals training, including Gohan at this point in time, are also kept largely off screen, further planting seeds for the eventual yield that will result in their first encounter with the Saiyan inv- Okay, actually, wait. There's one piece of filler that I'm glossing over, and honestly, it was the part of the show I never enjoyed watching. And that was Gohan's extra episode spent with those orphan children and other training hijinks. At first glance, this section of the story seems perfect for filler misadventures the same way Goku's trip across Snake Way offered. But as I mentioned, the choice to avoid demonstrating training is still a creative choice and one that the anime decided to change, that in my opinion served to not only kill the pacing, but also somewhat spoil the confidence that Gohan would eventually be demonstrated to have gained along his way to... The Saiyan Invasion. We'll be right back! And now for the exciting news. Many of you will know of or may even contribute to my Patreon at this point. Up until now, it's mostly just been a way for you guys to directly support me of your own volition. But now for the first time ever, it is evolving. We are completely overhauling it. Not only is it a great way to help the channel, but you will now be able to gain access to a wide variety of awesome exclusive perks. We've got amazing wallpapers for PC and mobile based on the great artwork I've had made for the channel over the years. And these now come with 
with time lapses of their creation too. Alongside this, you'll gain access to not only uncensored versions of the videos, but you'll be able to watch in progress previews as soon as they're finished during the week. No more waiting for YouTube. But a big part of this is really about connecting with you guys and ensuring the most passionate of you have your voices heard. We'll be taking video suggestions from you guys as well as producing an exclusive Q&A video every single month. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without a series of my incredibly embarrassing outtakes that my crew sure love to laugh at every single week. Examining her newly acquired pit... So please, head over to my Patreon, linked in the description, and see what tiers work best for you. And either way, your contribution will now result in your name featured at the end of our videos as a way to recognize you and say thanks. This channel wouldn't be possible without you guys, and I hope this Patreon serves as a great place to support one another with these awesome rewards. I can't wait for you guys to see some of them. <laughs> I've been waiting to talk about this one for a long time. Nappa and Vegeta set a bold new standard for this series in this arc. Gone are the days of camp pageantry or gag fuel bosses with humorous underlings. Vegeta and Nappa are cold-blooded killers and Toriyama wants you to understand what this means for our heroes right out the gate, as they effectively glass an entire city. And while this might be a rather climactic statement made in this scene by dusting this entire town of life, it comes packed with some subtle exposition and insight also. Firstly, tension is built through our newfound understanding of the Saiyan homeworld's gravity situation. These are monstrously quick and savagely strong foes. Secondly, I like how they allude to Gohan's power being one of the two most substantial power readings based on their initial scouter scans. Furthermore, these expectations for Gohan are only further emphasized when Krillin himself, upon his arrival on the battlefield, compares Gohan with his father when he was a kid. This sets an interesting expectation for us as readers because, aside from seeing a more confident Gohan surviving in the wild at times, we've not really seen how he performs in combat since his run-in with Raditz. And while I'm on the topic of Gohan, I do like that at every available opportunity he dissuades people's expectations of Piccolo as this maniac or monster of evil. Like Goku, he sees him for who he is, not what he projects. And thematically, there's a lot there in terms of being who you are versus what you're expected to be. Similar to how Goku is who he is without fear, Piccolo at this present time is conflicted somewhat, even if he doesn't show it. The sudden exposition onto Piccolo from Vegeta and Nappa certainly takes him by surprise concerning his ancestry. And the final piece of subtle exposition from the Saiyans is a key aspect of Vegeta's characterization that is communicated early, and that is his intelligence. He recalls the name of the Dragon Balls instantly, points out how reckless Nappa's glassing of an entire city was because it could have contained a Dragon Ball, and beyond even that, Vegeta is the first to acknowledge almost immediately how worthless the Scouters themselves are based entirely on Raditz's encounter with the Earthlings prior. It's terrific stuff and demonstrates to us that while Vegeta might be more monstrous than Nappa in every metric, shocking as that may be, He's also double threatening because he possesses the ability to abstractly think on the fly and compose strategy based on available, scarce information. But that's enough preamble, it's time to start fighting. <laughs> I think the choice of using the Cybermen is sort of emblematic of how Vegeta and Nappa view and value strength in the story. They each see the Earth's fighters, aside from Piccolo because he's sort of an Amekian, as weaklings. These folks are born on Earth destined to be weak despite their efforts. Conversely, the Saiyans carry themselves around with this overinflated sense of self-importance specifically because of their ancestry. Because they know that they are this strong naturally. They are born this way. They cannot fathom elements like teamwork, specific martial arts practice or technique, and heart playing any sort of meaningful role in battle. And so, 
supplanting these Cybermen, beings that grow from the ground with no experience, no martial arts training, and no sense of self, only highlight how this is all the Saiyans believe is valuable in fighting. In other words, the raw strength that you're born with. However, much to their surprise, each one of the Earth's fighters defeats their respective Cybermen in one-on-one -on -one combat. Ten Shinhan, in seconds, absolutely dismantles his Cybermen with little to no effort, much to Nappa and Vegeta's shock and surprise. Because he was bested, Vegeta kills him mercilessly without consideration for anything beyond his ability to fight or lack thereof, citing that because he was defeated, he no longer served any purpose. Quote, the Earthlings already defeated him. It would have been a waste of time. Even Yamcha technically possessed more than the necessary power to defeat his Cybermen. It was only when he let his guard down he was taken aback by this creature's lack of humanity, lack of self-preservation, and its immense conviction to only care about the result and not itself. Which again speaks to this philosophy the Saiyans have regarding power. It's all that matters to them. Nothing else is important. Reflected in how the Cyberman carelessly treats its own well-being. Its life is meaningless. It's just a number, a meat shield that serves a basic function to kill, to fight, to win. Because of this, it stands to reason why someone like Yamcha, who doesn't at all view the world this way, is taken off guard by this kamikaze play. As is every single last one of the Earth's fighters, including Piccolo, much to the joy of Vegeta, who laps up this strategic ploy. Yamcha gets a lot of mockery following this display, and honestly, it's a funny meme. But in the story, the point of the scene is to highlight that this was something none of the Earth's fighters could have foreseen coming by virtue of how they value other things beyond just winning. It could have and likely would have happened to many or any of them. Prior to this stepping up to the plate, Yamcha told Krillin that he'd go first as he could be wished back to life given that Krillin didn't have that same luxury, being brought back in Dragon Ball arcs prior. And once the Cyberman self-destructs, Krillin reflects on this sacrifice, insinuating that this would have been him had Yamcha not been so considerate of his friend's fate. So in actuality, while this scene is remembered as yet another slip up by Yamcha, ultimately he's taking one for the team, absorbing a blow that could have and likely would have taken each and every one of them off guard if they were in that same position. A selfless sacrifice and one that draws out of Krillin, the Earth's secret power. <laughs> Missing one, it lunges at Gohan, who despite what he just saw is totally frozen. All this training, all this preparation, all this anticipation, and he freezes. In a wonderful moment of guardianship, Piccolo demonstrates his ability and watchful eye of Gohan by quickly disposing of this remaining Cyberman. And while also a wonderful demonstration of why Yamcha taught him with his sacrifice, it is also our first indication that unlike his father, Gohan is not ready for this. Not even close. However, this doesn't stand out too much at this point because, well, everyone is taken off guard and paralyzed by what takes place next. <laughs> Frightening as this move is, with an intensity of visual carnage to rival anything we've seen so far in the series, this scene's thematic highlight and clever contrast comes not through Ten Shinhan, but instead through his longtime friend and partner, Chiaotzu. <laughs> My quick breakdown earlier of the philosophy behind Yamcha's Cyberman Kamikaze was partially to illustrate what the Saiyans believe in order to establish a clear contrast between them and the forces of Earth. However, there was a secondary purpose and it was for this scene right here. I mentioned that one of the aspects that took Yamcha off guard was his inability to conceive of this particular strategy from this invading evil force. In other words, Yamcha was too good, too loving of a person with too much to live for, where he would so frivolously cast aside his his life like that. A cursory glance at Chiaotzu's attack on Nappa might appear to share many of the same parameters, but truthfully, it is again a terrific highlight of this difference that exists between the Saiyans and the Earthlings, where the Cybermen attacked out of instinct and fear of consequence, attacking with a singular goal. Chiaotzu's attack is one of desperation to save everyone. Like Yamcha, his is a sacrifice born out of a desire to prevent more pain coming to his friends by giving up everything. And Nappa, just like Yamcha, 
for the opposite reasons, never saw this attack coming. In other words, where Yamcha was too good of a person, Nappa was so bought into this idea of might makes right and power is all that matters that he couldn't foresee anyone, let alone himself, doing something like Chaozu did for his friends that day. It's another spectacular narrative choice that carries with it so much meaning and thematic significance. Both Yamcha and Chaozu offered up their lives and in doing so not just saved their friends momentarily, but through this leverage of their characters, Akira Toriyama was able to establish concretely what these Saiyans are. Heartless monsters with no value for anything or anyone beyond their own selfish interest. And in the case of the Earthlings, while not enough to stop Vegeta or Nappa, they are certainly much more than either of the two cruel Saiyans ever imagined they possibly could be. Piccolo isn't yet fully bought into this idea of self-sacrifice, however, and part of him still wants to believe that he's bad to the bone. And I think because of that, despite being shocked just as bad as everyone else as he watches what unfolds with these fallen warriors, he's also the only one able to retain a semblance of timing and strategy, and thankfully, he too can bring those like Krillin and Gohan into his plan of action. A plan that actually looks as though it's going to work. Right as Nappa is about to kill Ten Chinhan, Piccolo gives gives the signal before disappearing suddenly and reappearing right before Nappa landing his own brutish animalistic slash from his claws onto the brutal and heinous Saiyan. Following this, the seasoned Earthling Krillin matches his effort with his own clubbing strike setting up Gohan for the perfect final attack. The strategy was perfect. The strongest of the Earth's fighters sets up the attack with what is the most dangerous part, confronting Nappa directly. Following this, Krillin, someone who can be relied on in a pinch, one who earned Piccolo's respect in arcs prior during the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai, nails his role here also. And now, hurtling towards Gohan, the second strongest fighter from Earth, he freezes. Because of course this happened. Unlike Piccolo, unlike Krillin, and unlike even Goku, this isn't Gohan's natural state. Standing on the battlefield with monsters, forced to bear witness to graphic deaths and attacks time and again, almost coming close to dying himself. This was always going to be the outcome. Because as I've mentioned time and again in this video, Gohan isn't special or interesting because of his abilities, but instead, his lack of them and his determination to keep trying despite this natural aversion he has to fighting and danger. In the blink of an eye, this small and scared five-year-old child has watched three allies all die in horrific and tragic fashion. It's worth noting that earlier I mentioned Piccolo was the strongest of the Earth's forces and that Gohan was second. However, I said that only really because it was what Nappa and Vegeta assumed based on their initial readings at the time and who they discovered once they arrived to investigate. But as it happens, Gohan, according to Piccolo, has greater power dwelling within him than even he possesses. This juxtaposition between Gohan's latent ability and his desire to avoid conflict at all costs is a match made in heaven, narratively speaking, placing a tremendous amount of hope and responsibility on his capable but small and unsure shoulders is the perfect recipe for manufacturing tension and exciting moments. However, before we get to that, the Saiyans, and by Saiyans I mean Vegeta, recognizes that Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin's talk of Goku must mean Kakarot is soon to arrive. And giddy to torture his son before his very eyes, they jump at the chance to give the Saiyan traitor Kakarot the time he needs to reach the battlefield. But three hours pass, and he still doesn't show up. From this point on, every single moment is spent showcasing another one of the arc's themes. That being the Earthling's unwillingness to give up. From Piccolo's failed plan against Nappa to Gohan miraculously withstanding Nappa's full-on attack to Krillin still managing to get an attack off against Nappa. The remaining three fighters continue endlessly in their endeavor to fight back, despite how obviously beaten they are. It's a level of determination against adversity that not only befuddles Nappa to the point of rage, but is, in the end, a driving force that is pivotal to the eventual victory of Earth as a whole. That drive to carry on despite adversity is an attitude that both Nappa and Vegeta are completely alien to. 
they were born into a higher class, and from what has been indicated to us thus far, have likely largely bulldozed over pretty much every foe they've ever faced up until now. In other words, there is no obstacle for them to overcome normally. They are the obstacle, but that difference in perspective is what makes all the difference here, and just plays even more into the themes of the upcoming fight against Vegeta, the themes of class, of the resolute strength that the Earthlings' lower class status has instilled in them ensuring they will continue training and fighting back until their final breath. Piccolo said it best, the Earth doesn't go down easily. And he's saying that from experience. And that's when it happens. Goku arrives at the check-in station to find Kami as he's transported to the land of the living once again. And the moment Goku's body arrives in that realm, Vegeta's scouter surges into action, alerting him to something they never expected. It reads, a power level of 5,000 closing in on their location. Shocked, he orders Nappa to kill them all immediately. While this wasn't to be expected, I love that Vegeta has the wherewithal to assess the situation and strategize. With limited time before Kakarot's imminent arrival, he concludes that with Earthlings, appearances can be deceiving. And if Kakarot was raised here too, that means that he also could be hiding something more than what was initially read on the scouters. Odds are, if these Earthlings could help Kakarot, things could prove challenging for the Saiyans. I mean, Vegeta's awareness compared to Nappa here is chilling but exhilarating to watch. It's remarkable how exciting this was to read through. It's just handled so perfectly. Time and again, we're always given more of a reason to hold on, to hold out just one moment longer. And man, you might not register this upon your first read or watch, but this is the first attack Gohan has leveled against these invaders. It's his first attack and it's by far the most significant on Nappa thus far. And he knows it. See that? This might be the most significant point in the story so far. Everyone is down. Goku isn't here, and Gohan is face to face with the strongest attack leveled against anyone thus far in the entire series. The only one who seems to have the strength to make it to his feet is Piccolo. And as the son of his lifelong enemy faces certain death, Piccolo drops the last remaining facade of evil and steps headfirst into a new era of his character as he gives up his life for another. Son Goku no iki o tometa ato, ktatabi kisamara no o ni natte aru. Ko yasu wa mada iki te o, iki no ne o tome ne ba naran. Ika shite o ite wa ikan no da. It cannot be overstated how powerful this moment is. For most of us in the English-speaking world, the Z anime was our first experience with this story, which means that just shy of 40% of the story was missing to us. And as a result, much of the Saiyan arc's bombshell moments such as these are muted in the grand context of the series. One moment we're introduced to Goku and the next we're told he's an alien. One moment we're introduced to Piccolo and told he was a villain before we see he's good again. Or at worst, an anti-villain. The pieces are there, but the sheer weight of what the first 40% of the story provided is not. Piccolo's sacrifice here is one of Dragon Ball's finest character moments. It's the culmination of a character arc spanning so many volumes and it's a moment Toriyama spent so much time building to in this arc alone. This is a character born with the sole desire to kill Son Goku and more than that was born with this goal specifically in mind. One inherited from his creator and one evidence with malicious force as he mercilessly broke all of Goku's limbs in their first iconic battle. But this arc changes everything. Killing Goku in this battle against Raditz technically achieves Piccolo's goal, but it's never seen as such, nor is it presented that way. In fact, Piccolo compliments Goku's prowess in the battle, and he uses his death as merely a means to rile up Raditz by reminding him Goku will live again. The change is already clear at this point, but as Piccolo takes Gohan away to train him, this transition in alignment only becomes stronger, to the point that God himself actively tells us this is the case. 
In fact, arguably before Piccolo even realizes it himself. Throughout Gohan's training, Piccolo is a brutal master. On the surface. He leaves Gohan to fend for himself, but still takes the time to leave him apples. He removes Gohan's tail for the sake of removing a weakness, but follows up with clothing and a weapon. Every dark moment is followed by one of tenderness, and by the time the battle rolls around, their chemistry is strong to the point of being referred to collectively. We've become far stronger. And as Nappa faces Gohan, Piccolo makes a choice. He casts aside not just his life, but the Dragon Balls too. He puts aside everything for this child he has nurtured and bonded with over the last several months, and gives up his life instead. And it's at this moment the facade drops. What God realized months ago finally comes pouring out of Piccolo's own mouth. Gohan changed him. Quote, you were the only one who ever really talked to me. That familial path he was set on by his creator was disrupted by the sheer innocence and love of a child. A running theme in this arc is that of bucking existing expectations based on this idea of inherited responsibility. Others having expectations of Gohan as Goku's firstborn son. Goku learning he's in many ways the antithesis of what the Saiyans represent in the cosmos and Piccolo in a similar fashion we can see has struggled with his own identity issues since his arrival in the story. This sort of messaging is all over this arc, even going as far as to subvert our own expectations of certain characters. Take Gohan for example son of the main character and his very first key blast his first signature technique isn't a kamehameha it's a move from piccolo a move literally called masenko or demon flash this is all to say that the message of this arc has always been that who we are is not and should not be dictated to us by our race by our culture or our relatives in the same way Goku was demonized by Raditz for being unlike how he viewed a Saiyan should be, Piccolo too was born with expectations and believed he needed to live up to those expectations as they were his life's greatest purpose. He even believed it, but as pointed out by Gohan, his father would tell him that Piccolo wasn't ever really a bad person like King Piccolo was before him. And firsthand, Gohan discovered that Piccolo was quite the opposite to how many had described him before. And that's what this moment is, a culmination of everything. A final act of defiance against who he expected himself to be in order to be true to who he is. No longer living a lie, instead choosing to die the hero. It is genuinely one of Toriyama's finest character moments and a real triumph in an arc full of incredible scenes. <laughs> this is what relief feels like. Toriyama has given us so much in this arc, placed our point of view onto Gohan, formed new bonds with unlikely heroes, demonstrated the tenacity of Earth in more ways than one, and systematically has torn down and taken away each and every one of these. Culminating with and teasing the final nail in the coffin, Gohan's ultimate defeat and death at the hands of Nappa, only to remind us that this is still Goku's story. There's something to be said for how Goku arrives on the battlefield during the Saiyan arc, and while it's effortlessly cool to watch this offbeat, somewhat lighthearted character nonchalantly waltz from one side of the battlefield to the next without so much as acknowledging Vegeta or Nappa's taunts and jeers, in a way, by virtue of being true to his own values, by being silent, by focusing first and foremost on his friends showing sentiment and concern for their well-being, Goku's attitude, by default, flies in the face and insults the Saiyan way of life. It immediately communicates to us as readers what this situation really is. At this point, Goku has so astronomically surpassed Nappa, he isn't even really a concern to him. And while Nappa sees this as Goku having a death wish rather than a concern for his loved ones, we as readers know otherwise. It sets up this level of impending catharsis, or should I say, impending beatdown, that only Goku can deliver. Once again, Goku, by being who he is, rejects this supposed way of life Vegeta and Nappa represent. <laughs> versus Nappa. Much like Piccolo, Goku was believed to have been sent to this world to conquer it, to kill, to ravage, to enslave, but that wasn't who Piccolo was, and as Nappa is quickly finding out, that isn't who Goku is either. To Nappa, sentiment, mercy, consideration for others are all signs of weakness. 
Weakness that leads him to vastly underestimate Goku when he first engaged with him. <laughs> What's so fascinating about this fight is that it actually marks an important shift in Akira Toriyama's philosophy. If you cast your minds back to the pre-Z portion of the story, Goku's small demeanor was used to create David vs Goliath type moments. The smaller power besting giants so to speak. Whether it be King Piccolo or Sergeant Metallic, Goku's small stature and excitable personality was pitted against these huge menacing foes. And Goku's fight against Nappa is an awesome one and, and follows this same approach. Just look at how small Goku is pictured against this guy only to style on him again and again and again, with Toriyama breaking out some of the more dynamic and fun angles in his toolkit. It's a short but incredibly cathartic bout that's been much needed amidst all that was lost. But it's here that Akira Toriyama flips the design philosophy on its head. Vegeta, a tiny speck of a man, ruthlessly obliterates Nappa in an instant. The smaller of the pair is by far the most powerful, and in spite of Goku's bout against Nappa serving to show us just how much he's improved, this surprise moment, this switch up in design philosophy not only brutally brings reality crashing back down around us, but it also reminds us that this isn't the same happy-go-lucky Dragon Ball we all know and love anymore. From Freeze's tiniest form being his most mighty, to the same being true for Cell, and of course, the minuscule Evil Boo really slams this philosophy home. It's a simple but effective switching conveyance of power, and man, it sure does nicely set the stage for arguably the greatest clash in the history of shonen manga. I have touched exclusively on the manga so far because I've always been of the mind that approaching the story in its purest form, right from the author, is the best way to examine a story, but this is Dragon Ball Z. I would imagine almost all of us got into this series through the anime, whether it be on Toonami back in the day or through Kai if you're part of the next generation. It's a cultural landmark of a series and the staff who put it together are just as important to its worldwide success as Akira Toriyama himself. And so I want to take you on a journey with the staff who made this show a reality, explore their styles and how their hierarchy changed across the show's seven years on the air. Yep, that's right, seven years. There's no way that can be right! You see, in spite of the big Toei Animation logo slapped right on the show, Dragon Ball Z was predominantly outsourced to a large number of subcontracted studios. While Toei is a colossal mammoth of a production house these days, back in the day they straight up lacked the manpower needed to produce a weekly show like Dragon Ball entirely in-house. In other words, they needed a lot of help. For the Saiyan arc alone that we're covering today, there are six studios to introduce, and by the end of the series, that number will have doubled to 12. Dragon Ball Z is one massive collaborative project of varying quality, and that quality is almost entirely determined by the studio that worked on it each given week. First up is Studio Junio. Perhaps one of the most important of those introduced today, this studio was led by the very character designer of the show, Minoru Maeda. This man has been with the series since the very beginning, serving as the character designer for both the Dr. Slump anime before Dragon Ball, as well as the original Dragon Ball series. His ability to mimic Toriyama's art during this era was really second to none, and the character sheets for this arc truly set a solid foundation for all the various studios to follow. But of course, animation requires animators, and it was the key animators animators he had under him that were the ones truly responsible for elevating the episodes he led. At this point in the series, Maeda's team was primarily made up of a mix of Junio and Toy Animation in-house animators. These included Masaki Sato, Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, Takio Ide, and Hisashi Iguchi. Four phenomenal talents of which you may have even heard of already. Sato and Nakatsuru especially produced some of the most phenomenal character art during this portion of the series, truly taking Dragon Ball art to a whole new level. While Iguchi and Ide were still more than capable of producing striking artwork, their talents for actual movement were where they really shone, and you can see that in their seriously dynamic output. But on the whole, Junio were very much an art-driven team, and so it's no surprise that so many of those beloved close-ups come from this very team. The level of fidelity found across their episodes is honestly insane. If I could draw like Misaki Sato, I would die a happy man. However, Dragon Ball's big appeal is in its fights, and when it comes to spectacular battles, that is where the iconic studio Segasha comes in. Whatever iconic bow comes to mind from this arc, it almost certainly comes from the team at this magnificent studio. Led by Tomokichi Takeuchi in this arc, Segasha was compiled of four main talents at this stage. Yoko Izuka, 
Masako Mizumi, and most importantly, Masahiro Shimanuki and Kazuya Hisada. Although Mizumi and Izuka absolutely add value to their team, particularly arcs I'll cover in the future, it's primarily Shimanuki and Hisada who are just mind-blowingly good here, and animate arguably the most iconic moments of this arc. Shimanuki's work in Segasha's first Z episode is so strong. There's a real powerful rigidity to his work and his artwork is honestly insane. But when you move forward throughout the arc, you'll see he animates some of the most incredible parts of Goku vs Vegeta too, including that famous beam struggle. Nobody draws debris quite like this man, he really is something else here. Although Kazuya Hisada is often seen as an equal to Shimanuki, and in terms of skill he 100% is. He's actually his junior when it comes to the industry standing at this point, having only been promoted to key animator with Z's fourth episode. In spite of this however, his early work on this series still manages to be excellent, filled with the great and dynamic movement he'll eventually become known for. And by the time the climax rolls around, he's delivering some truly breathtaking work. Now, I think what's cool is that Takeuchi, the animation supervisor for Segasha at this point, is a pretty talented animator in his own right and found plenty of time to produce his own strong contributions to the series. With a very animation-focused brain, he'd also quite often let his star talents under him shine with minor or no corrections to their work. And, well, recognizing the talent of those under you and knowing when to correct and when not to is a very important skill and not one every supervisor understands, unfortunately. Introducing Shindo Production. Named after its supervisor here, Mitsuo Shindo is certainly someone with a very distinctive style and a completely unwavering touch when it comes to corrections. If you work under him, well, you're absolutely getting your work redrawn to look like his regardless of how good it looked in the first place. And, well, the people under him at this point are Teruhisa Ryu, Noriko Shibata, and a very famous name these days, Tadayoshi Yamamuro. As a result of Shindo's corrections, and because the studio aren't hugely animation oriented at this point, it's difficult to pinpoint particular staff with 100% certainty in this arc. But I think it's at least interesting to look at Shindo's style. It is extremely angular, to the point that it really stands out against the episodes that surround them. It's not bad or anything, but it sure is at odds with Maeda's design sheets and even Toriyama's own work for this era. Next up is Studio Last House. For all intents and purposes, Last House is the backbone of Dragon Ball Z regardless of anything I will say about their quality. Their existence is pivotal and they animate the highest number of episodes in the series by a mile, often allowing elongated schedules for other studios episodes. The team was led by Masayuki Uchiyama who, well, let's just say their evolution across this series might not result in them having the best reputation, but their work on this arc is actually solid thanks to Maeda's rounder designs here meshing well with Uchiyama's own blobbier style. Under him are some pretty substantial players in the Dragon Ball world though. Akio Katada, Katsuya Seki, Taichiro Ohara, and Naoto Shishida. It's the latter who carry this team like no other. Ohara is a master of movement, especially with vehicles in this arc for some reason. Shida is likewise a real powerhouse of an animator and you almost definitely know his name already thanks to his crazy popular output these days. You can really see the beginning of that famous style creeping through in his early work here also. I mean, it's been 30 years and he still draws ears the exact same way. In spite, however, of this talent under him, Uchiyama does often find himself criticized for his episodes thanks to his animation corrections. While he sometimes does make work arguably worse, even the ones where they're an improvement tend to look quite flat and amateur looking as he doesn't have particularly great line confidence with his own drawings. It's a very similar tale with the next studio too, Studio Live. Yukio Ebizawa leads the charge here, and while he's a better animator than Uchiyama, his style at this point in the series is bizarre to say the least. He has perhaps the largest variety of animators under him across this arc, and so listing them all probably isn't the most realistic until they stabilize later, but I do want to highlight Tomiya Ida as a particular standout. And unfortunately, someone who also serves to demonstrate how strange Ebizawa's corrections can be. I mean, look at this! The impact of the pose is so much improved, but what a bizarre style that totally shifts it off model from the on model original. And that's basically what you get when it comes to Ebizawa. And that brings us to the final, well, it's not really a studio actually, it's a single person, but Katsumi Aoshima. 
This man is a beast and largely produced his episodes on his own, with the exception of some small help from the likes of Hideko Okimoto. And if you haven't noticed, I think solo animators are awesome. Not only does it take insane skill to animate an entire 26 minute long episode almost entirely by yourself, but it really lends itself well to a production's health. Being able to slot yourself into a show at any given time to allow other teams more time to work on their episodes is invaluable. And well, that speed is worth a lot. There was once an animator with that kind of speed who did so much work in a given year that they made more money than the head of the studio and bought a Porsche. How's that for reward for work? I say Porsche, yeah. It's longer. And okay, that's quite the mixed bag of our roster I've just now outlined, and yet this arc is still an excellent bit of television. And well, that's because, of course, animation isn't the only thing that makes for good TV. A good director is pivotal, especially a series director, the one in charge of the overall approach to the show. For Dragon Ball Z, this was handled by Daisuke Nishio for the majority of its run. Nishio had already been a part of the original Dragon Ball series alongside Dr. Slump director Minoru Okazaki, as the higher-ups weren't convinced Okazaki was fit to lead an action-oriented series like Dragon Ball alone, and, uh, with a series like Dragon Ball Z being so insanely action-driven, Okazaki just wasn't really needed anymore. Sorry, bud. So, Nishio took the reins and kicked off the series with a bang, with a team of very competent regular directors under him too. And the most extraordinary of all has to be Yoshihiro Ueda. This man is just absurd. Remember when I said Segasha was the go-to studio for the incredibly animated episodes? Well, Ueda's the one for direction. His storyboards are honestly flawless, chock full of creative angles beyond Toriyama's own paneling and filled with really seriously impressive lighting choices. This man knows how to set a mood, genuinely, like any of those spectacular episodes you remember from this part of the series were probably directed by him. And if they weren't, it was Nishio. The pair are just spectacular together. I'd uh, bend the knee, but... And so, with introductions over, the story of Dragon Ball Z's production is really just beginning. Keep the names mentioned in mind going forward too, as with each video in this series, we'll be taking a look at who else joins the fray, their standout episodes, and how each of those studios begins to evolve and blossom. Or, in some cases, even devolve. And so now, with the animation stage set, I think the setting is perfect for... <laughs> Goku versus Vegeta. My friends, this is arguably the greatest fight in all of Dragon Ball. Arguably the most iconic battle in all of Japanese manga and anime. And for me, it is the single most influential and important fight scene I'll ever watch. Why? Because this is the very first time I ever saw Dragon Ball. However, if we push aside my internal biases for a split second, I think there's a lot of merit to the suggestion that this is a story known for having some of the best fight scenes in anime, and this could very well be Dragon Ball's finest. Sure, it might not hit the iconic highs of the Frieza vs Goku fight, or excite millions around the world like Cells, but what this fight does better than any other in my opinion is do everything. And I do mean everything right. One of the first things I noticed when reading this fight was how Toriyama liked to play with characters positioning to invite tension and to establish a sense of hierarchy, which is perfectly fitting for a fight scene designed to explore the themes of class. The mission statement of the fight is reiterated right from the outset, quote, on this planet we know that even the lowest born can outdo the elite if they work hard enough, says Goku. In response to that, Vegeta says, Now I'll show you the wall you could never scale with hard work alone. This difference in worldview is specifically what this fight is about. Vegeta sees himself as higher than Goku and thus Toriyama reflects this inflated sense of authority onto Vegeta by positioning him physically higher up than Goku. During the beginning standoff he's seen as slightly higher, reflecting Vegeta's confidence. However, after that first exchange ends with Vegeta clearly getting the better of it, that confidence is validated and grows. Vegeta is naturally the stronger of the two and is positioned even higher again. Up until now, it has been very rarely seen that Goku is the weaker of the two fighters in any given arc. Heck, the purpose of some of those early tournament arcs was specifically to follow other characters as they navigate solutions to Goku's obvious strength advantages. But this arc establishes Goku as the clear weaker of the two. Not as a swerve at the end of a battle hard fought, but instead at the beginning. Why? 
because now with the strength question having been answered, all that remains left for Goku to lean on are the attributes he has that separate him specifically from the likes of Vegeta. And those traits are the techniques he's learned and the friendships he's forged. I didn't realize this small detail on my first read through, but during Goku's bout with Nappa, there's an instance where he takes his blast head on, or should I say chest on, hands up in the air with his ki and gi absorbing the blast as if it were nothing. Seeing this made me recall what King Kai also said to Goku about his gi when he was gifting it to him towards the end of their training before he left. That being that it could deflect small attacks. Symbolically, the gi he's wearing represents the first line of defense against the Saiyans from his friends and in this first flurry with Vegeta, it gets torn to rags, proving that Vegeta's going to be a real tough opponent to overcome even with all that sets Goku apart from him. And in this moment with the appropriate stressors on Goku, now we get to measure what makes him special against a character like Vegeta. And interestingly, this pushes Goku in ways he's never been pushed before. It's an incredible surge of energy, but one that comes with its own drawbacks, both literally and figuratively through Vegeta's own furious reaction and counter. Notice how at the beginning he was positioned as this ever-looming figure looking down at the wretched lower class offspring that Goku represented. But now Goku brought Vegeta to his knees, forcing Vegeta's hand in one of the best and most effective symbolic clashes from this fight, soaring high into the sky, the prince of all Saiyans, the elite of the elite, burning brighter than Goku could ever possibly imagine, looking down from on high, the self-professed most powerful in the universe, and right beneath him, as the only line of defense between the Earth and certain destruction, stands Goku, alone and exhausted. But Goku isn't alone. He never was. <coughs> Erupting in a violent torrent of power, tenacity and tremendous energy, Goku goes to use his ace, his most reliable technique, the Kamehameha. It surges from his palms to block Vegeta's earth-shattering attack. Across this incredible journey from the very first arc all the way to today, Goku has met some of the most incredible people and learned even more incredible feats and techniques from them. And fittingly, the technique that he first learned from the Earth's defender is what once again acts as a shield both for him and the planet he once defended. But symbolism isn't all there is here. In fact, I think this is where fighting as a mechanic peaks for Dragon Ball personally. Where the future might yield more iconic and memorable moments, snapshots in history like Goku's initial transformation on Namek or the various forms of fusion which gave rise to tons of speculation and fan art over the years, it's this period of Dragon Ball's action that plays host to three new techniques that all share a common attribute that is perfect for building tension in the heart of combat. And this commonality these techniques all share is risk versus reward. In other words, this fight is the final culmination of Goku's martial arts training specifically. Where fights after will be host to Goku overcoming his physical limits in terms of power and strategy, Goku vs Vegeta is the last hurrah for Goku, the martial artist. So let's take a look at this fight under the microscope to see just how it ticks and how the techniques used emphasize the ideologies and strengths of the respective fighters. But let's get something straight from the outset. Walking right up to Vegeta in the first place and asking his friends to dip was a recipe for disaster for Goku. Goku is objectively, when it comes to raw data, much weaker than Vegeta. He's slower, physically inferior currently, and can't even rely on his battle IQ or tenacity like he usually does to make up the difference, because just like him, Vegeta is very experienced and clever. So where does Goku look when he's out of options? Well, if you think back across all of Dragon Ball, you need to ask only one question. What does Goku always want to do? To fight strong opponents in order to get stronger. It's a very simple desire and one you might not think is too dissimilar to Vegeta's. However, there is a subtle difference to their respective goals that results in them being total opposites. While Vegeta wants to be the strongest, Goku wants to be stronger. Vegeta's end goal is him standing atop the mountain. Goku doesn't have an end goal, a destination, nothing beyond simple but consistent improvement over time. It's a lesson that was reinforced onto him through his grandpa Gohan and indeed Master Roshi in early Dragon Ball. That he should keep training, keep learning, keep improving because there will always be someone else stronger around the next corner. 
Unlike Goku, Vegeta's worldview has a very simple and clear hierarchy structure, one within which he sees himself sitting atop of. In this very first fight, Vegeta refers to himself as the strongest in the universe, which, whether he's correct or not, reflects a belief that according to Vegeta, there isn't anything he can learn from anyone simply because he's already better than them by his own birthright. The difference between these two characters means that Goku is always eager to seek out training and tutelage from wise masters, while Vegeta isn't. The Kaioken. Kaioken. Ah! Developed and taught to him by King Kai, this technique proved to be what kept Goku in the fight initially. Magnifying the damage he could deal along with an explosion of speed, this move too came packed with a massive amount of recoil on his body when he pushed himself too far using it. So much so that by the time the first significant section of the fight had concluded, a simple tap on the back from Yajirobe was enough to leave him screaming. The quote, power management side of this fight against Vegeta is worth contrasting with the most recent big clash of Piccolo versus Goku. In that fight, Goku had spent years mastering control over his body and ki, and was able to let loose immense power without even breaking so much as a sweat. I mean, at the very end of the fight, he still had that unreal flurry of attack to unfold on Piccolo. And him being worn down was a direct result of the damage Piccolo had been dealing to him. But here, with Vegeta, he is having to go nuclear and burn through his energy reserve at a rapid rate to even compete. It goes a long way to show just how dire things truly are. The beam struggle Goku engaged in was a wonderful culmination of all of these traits I'm talking about, leveraging his own tenacity while combining the techniques passed down to him by Roshi and King Kai respectively. A short term win for tremendous long term loss in order to put Vegeta in his place momentarily. A place where Vegeta was forced to reconsider his worldview and he didn't like that. The Ozaru. The Ozaru in this context is the thematic opposite to Goku's Kaioken in many respects. Not something passed down to him or taught, not something which came with its own risk versus reward metric to consider, but a simple times 10 multiplier to his own already immense power. Many of you might point out that this isn't exactly a new technique to the series and it's obvious why anyone would think that. I mean, it's been used a number of times across the story from the very first arc all the way to the middle of this one with Gohan. However, However, the important distinction here is that unlike every other time in the series, Vegeta is in full control. He's not a wild beast cutting loose on a random area, he's very clearly capable of much more specific movements, defensive maneuvers, and even speech. Unlike Goku's techniques, there's virtually no downside to this move from Vegeta. Well, apart from the jab to his own pride for needing to resort to such a measure in the first place against someone as lowly as Kakarot. With all of that said, this technique released by Vegeta, while it wasn't his intention, unconsciously this might have been one of the most significant blows to Goku's emotional state I've seen and certainly for me the single most tragic and sad instance in all of the manga. A moment that drags our minds back to the very first arc of Dragon Ball. There's a rather large chunk of Goku's life we aren't privy to. The story itself starts off with Goku already 11 years of age living alone in a small house in the mountains, praying to the four-star ball he sees as his grandfather. It's his only family. And at the end of the first arc, we as an audience discover the truth when Goku begins talking about the moon and what his grandpa used to tell him about it. We put two and two together then and he transforms. But the dramatic irony of all of this has been that through all the damage he's caused, it's all been unconscious. A terrible truth that has been hidden from Goku for the longest time and we're reminded of this at the very beginning of this arc too when Roshi asks if Gohan has ever acted strangely around a full moon following the discovery of his tail. And so now as Vegeta transforms before him, it triggers a very early memory of Goku's. One that took place long before the beginning of this story. A moment in time where his grandpa would tell him about monsters that would come out at night. Goku's first words upon seeing this fully transformed state, I've heard of apes like you, you killed my grandpa. This one move from Vegeta produces one of the most negative mindsets I've seen Goku work through. 
One that causes him to literally say that he can't defeat this monster, that he can't save the earth, and one that leads him to somewhat accept his fate when he says that he'll apologize to his grandpa when he gets to heaven. It's a truly horrific place Goku finds himself psychologically, but he has one last ace up his sleeve to try. And in order to make space to attempt it, once again, Goku leverages a technique he learned from another dear friend. The Genki Dama. The Genki Dama is the most symbolic technique presented in this arc, one that's intrinsically tied to the messaging and themes contained therein. If there was ever a combination of techniques and circumstances that I would grant Toriyama a 10 out of 10 for when it comes to execution and storytelling, it would be his design of the Kaioken, the Genki Dama, and the Ozaru all mixed together. Following their bodies being brutalized and ravaged by the effects of the Kaioken, Vegeta and Goku are forced to take vastly different approaches that reflect their respective ideologies. In other words, because Goku used the Kaioken, Vegeta needed to use the Ozaru, and Goku then therefore needed to use the Genki Dama. Two techniques that when used in conjunction with one another create some of the most tense and exciting sequences I've ever read in a manga. Vegeta's Ozaru grants him enormous power, speed, and perfect control of his faculties. Whereas Goku's Genki Dama, while thankfully light on the effort he needs to expel from his body to utilize it, forces Goku into the most compromising position possible. One where he has his guard completely down, and one which forces him to take his attention away from the literal giant monster in the arena before him. It's an extraordinary and exciting sequence of believable cause and effect in what is quite literally the darkest encounter Goku has ever faced. And when he rolled his last dice, and it came up snake eyes, his legs are crushed. He admits defeat, and after firing the last remaining bit of energy he has right into Vegeta's eye, there and then resigns himself to death. I've never seen Goku like this. But again, Goku is never alone. <laughs> the Earth versus Vegeta. Now, this section, oh my god, this section, okay, woo, okay. When Dragon Ball is at its best, I don't think there are very many manga that can compete. At least when it comes to combat. It's next level, the storytelling, the emotion, the tension, the swerves, the drama, oh my god, the drama. The conclusion to this arc is utterly spectacular, and not only could I not think of a single thing I would change, whenever I read it, I'm always taken aback by how dumbfoundingly well executed and exciting it always is. The Genki Dama was what Goku believed was his last resort, but in actuality, there was always one other ace hiding up his sleeve, his allies and his loved ones. A number of times throughout this arc, it subtly brought up how much Goku's allies, friends, family, and even enemies value him. From Roshi's passing comment about how everyone worked together to gather the Dragon Balls when they discovered it was he who had passed, to Piccolo's kind words about him on his deathbed, there's something about Goku, who he is naturally, that attracts people to him. People who can help, who want to help, and those that will lay down their lives to protect him because they know he can and has done the very same for them. When Vegeta releases the fake moon into the sky, Krillin and Gohan notice as they near Kame House. But it isn't Krillin who turns back first. It's Gohan, the youngest and by far the most terrified and unsuited to this environment, was the first person to choose to come back to help at the first sign of irregularity. There's something to that that's just so damn powerful to me. And when they land to find Yajirobe, Krillin's strategy seems like a terrific one. With Gohan, once again, despite being the most non-confrontational naturally, he's the one that's tasked with getting the attention of Vegeta. And he succeeds. Oh my god, okay. I cannot begin to describe to you how 10-year-old Mark might have felt while watching this for the first time because Vegeta felt like a monster to me, the likes of which I had never seen before. Goku was down for the count indefinitely. Gohan has a spark of greatness, but he's still no match for the Saiyan Prince. And Krillin is much the same. And at this point in my read-through, I genuinely took a step back to take stock of just how dark this entire arc has been. 
Dragon Ball up until now had certainly its own fair share of darker moments here and there, but even taking that into account, this arc is on another level entirely. Goku dies in the first few chapters in one of the most graphic ways the series has seen. Gohan is kidnapped, Yamcha is killed brutally. The same goes for Chaozu, and the means with which Tenshinhan leaves this realm is one of the most awe-inspiring but at the same time tragically sad and pathetic send-offs. Vegeta kills his own partner and accidentally reveals to Goku the tragic fate of his grandpa and the role he played in it and following that, Goku resigns himself to death. This arc is just one horrific event after the next and as Gohan and Krillin are staring down the barrel of certain doom, Toriyama reminds us that we are still reading Dragon Ball. <laughs> I cannot express how perfect of a moment this is, and what could quite possibly be the single best swerve in the entire series. Everything, and I mean everything, works so well here. Yajirobe is shown to be training along with everyone else early in the arc. He even gets his own small speaking roles. He's shown to be part of the battlefield where Goku and Vegeta move to eventually, and he's never seen by Vegeta, thus giving credence to the notion that Vegeta wouldn't expect him to come. And he didn't! Watching him frantically scurry away, frightened immediately after the slice, is nothing short of hysterical. Leave it to Akira Toriyama to undercut one of the darkest and most intense moments from this series with one of the best, most perfectly timed and placed jokes I've ever seen committed to paper. And it doesn't ruin the tension, it doesn't ruin the drama, because it's still not enough! Say what you want about other arcs that came before this one, but Vegeta is a different breed of foe. The amount of times he dusts himself off and keeps trudging forward would put Michael Myers to shame. Nothing seems to stop this guy. Like a murderous, short, and bigoted Terminator, despite reverting to his original size, finds himself still to be the most superior on the battlefield. A circumstance that, while dire, still leaves Goku with more options than he otherwise had originally at his disposal. Gohan needs to step up to the plate one more time. And when he does, possibly my favorite part of this entire fight in terms of psychology and strategy comes into play. <laughs> There's a lot to say about this moment being Goku's or Krillin's or even Gohan's, but in reality, I think it's a perfect combined effort of all three. Goku, the man who traveled to hell and back to get the knowledge, the ability to defeat Vegeta only to fail, now has to channel the technique he was taught and pass it to the person he trusts more than anyone else on this planet. Krillin. A character that once epitomized the definition of underhanded jealousy in the series has grown to become one that recognizes his own faults and shortcomings faster than anyone else. And perhaps to a fault. Of all the Earthlings, Krillin is the only one that remains that can make any meaningful difference and being one of the only two that Goku can pass this responsibility off to, Krillin is his first choice. And in the end, he was the perfect choice. His own self-doubt gave him room to delay the throw long enough to listen to King Kai's advice. And if not for Yajirobe, Krillin would have been the hero of Earth there and then. But I'm so glad he wasn't, because what happens afterwards is even better. Now, alerted to the danger, Vegeta easily dodges the sphere, seeking his evil key. Now, hurtling towards Gohan, he has to act fast. The child that was less than a year ago too shy and scared to introduce himself without encouragement, now stands in opposition to the most terrifying man the Earth and Goku has ever encountered. One that not only threatens their lives, but wishes to torture them all. And what's more, he now stands down the single most powerful attack, his own father's most powerful attack, with the instruction of reflecting it back to that monster Vegeta. This entire sequence tells its own incredibly rich story that enraptured me from start to finish. An arc, a story, a fight, all about how relying on others is a sign of weakness, now proves to be the most decisive blow leveled against the most terrifying entity the Earth has ever been threatened by. An attack that could have happened had three or four Brave allies not rallied themselves to defeat a great Waka Waka! Oh my 
my god, this is the best arc ever. Just when you think this fight is over, when you think there couldn't possibly be more, Akira Toriyama says, hold my heat tap and brings out more remarkable swerves and revelations like Gohan's tail having regenerated like Goku's used to back in the day. Granted, this is a little or very convenient given the circumstances, but after what we've just seen, to me, this is just having fun and the icing on what is slowly becoming one of the most delicious cakes I've ever eaten. Okay, that, that analogy got a little away from me there towards the end, but what I'm saying is this story is great. Sure, it takes some liberties to make this happen, but it makes up for it because... <laughs> Yajirobe again! Yajirobe lands the attack! Toriyama used the regenerated tail of Gohan to create space for another incredibly funny Yajirobe swerve. I cannot describe to you the joy this story makes me feel. Yajirobe is a king, an unsung MVP of this story. And fittingly, what deals the finishing blow to Vegeta isn't a punch, a kick, a sword, or even an energy blast. But instead, the very transformation the Saiyans have used to conquer so many other worlds. A transformation that crippled Goku and one that took his grandpa away from him. And in the heat of that savage form, amidst all of the chaos and destruction, the reason of Son Gohan, the innate humanity he represents, was enough to allow him the clarity to target Vegeta specifically. And target him, he most certainly did. It's a thrilling turn of events as the last gasp of Earth's forces resulted in a roar the likes of which Vegeta narrowly escapes. And that's when it happens. He retreats. But this retreat and apparent victory is cut short by a curious request of Goku's. For no other reason beyond his own admitted selfish desires, he asks Krillin to spare his life so that he may one day fight him again. And in the end, the ultimate win for Earth, the prevailing of humanity, was capped off with a very Saiyan request from Goku. An aspect of him that will be explored even further in the next arc as this colorful cast of characters we've all grown so familiar with leave the comfortable confines of their homes to venture forth into the dark starry sky above in search for an answer to this question they've all collectively had. Can they bring their fallen friends back from beyond? Can they reach planet Namek to secure the Demekian Dragon Balls without succumbing to the dangers and terrors that lurk in deep space? Tune in next week to find out. But in conclusion, the difficulty in analyzing Dragon Ball Z like I have today comes from its abundance of characters that all independently deal with their own journeys. While their respective paths might intertwine in interesting and at times incredibly entertaining ways, these are still unique stories to each respective character that serve to not only create the cast we discussed today, but also serve to establish the infectious and engaging world of Dragon Ball we all wish we could be a part of. Structuring this video such that I gave enough time to explore the origins of what this arc and ultimately what Dragon Ball was trying to achieve is difficult and requires careful consideration. And if you feel as though I've glanced over certain aspects like Goku's first interaction with his brother acting for many as the beginning of Goku's road to accepting his Saiyan ancestry, rest assured I haven't forgotten about that section and instead have saved that material for a section I hope to cover in the next video covering the Frieza arc and Goku's ascension to legend in the manga industry. But in short, this is a story I grew up with and what this video represents is a view into my mind and how I perceive, understand and see Dragon Ball Z. In other words, this is why this story has been the most influential in my life and why I am writing this series at all. We've defeated the Saiyans everybody, but we are far from out of the woods yet. Next time we travel to Planet Namek and I can't wait for you all to join me on that mission too. But until then, I've been Mark Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.